Kia ora, everybody. And, and uh, you know, after a long day, thank you for, for joining us. And I hope, you know, at the end of this 50, 50 odd minutes that you could go away and make a cup of tea with something in your back pocket, which goes, oh, that, that got me to think slightly differently about something that I value. And, um, and I, the, when, when I was approached to do this, I, I hate things about leadership. Because especially if it's this idea that we're all heroic beasts carrying torches into the dark and, and an army of people are following us, cheering us on, because it's never struck me about how things actually get you know, are led. And, and during COVID, I got I was really became a, aware of the fact that often the leaders in our families, our communities, our schools are not the positional people. They're not necessarily the people with the positions. And I started thinking about an idea called invisible leadership. So what I kind of think this other kind of leader is, is it someone who has influence, especially when times are a bit difficult or when we're, you know, we're in the world without a roadmap. And, uh, and they, so they will, we often see them having, they influence kids, they influence other people in our community, like other people on our staff, other teachers, they influence communities. So they lead not from on top of the pyramid, but in a crisis, they're worth their weight in gold. And this is what we're going to think about today and how we look after those kinds of people. And maybe that's you. So there's a kind of a question right at the end around that one. So, um, so here's a we're going to start by just working by yourself on something. So, and no one's going to see what you write down. So if you've got a bit of paper beside you, or if you want to be digital, you write on something, no one's going to see this. This is just going to be two activities to yourself. And so here's the first one. Just thinking of you as a person. Can you think of um, three qualities that would be really bad for if in a leader, if you were working for someone and they were in a leadership position, three personal qualities that, that they might have as a leader that would actually be really damaging to someone like you. So three qualities as a leader that would be damaging to you. If you have a look at those three things, what you're saying is for someone like you, if that was a leader, that would be toxic or that would be, that would be really bad. That'd be bad qualities. So now I'm going to ask you to do something interesting with that. I want you to reverse those qualities and write those negative qualities down as what is the opposite of those. So you've got three qualities that for you would be toxic. Turn them into, turn each one into its reverse. So what you have on that piece of paper or whatever you're working on is a portrait of what you believe would be the qualities of a great leader for someone like you. So you're saying to yourself, these are qualities of leadership that would work for someone like me. So before we go into a breakout room where we're going to share those to create group portraits of what great leader might look like, ask yourself a wee question. Do these describe me? And if they don't, or if some of them don't, a deep question you can ask is, what do I do to fill in that gap when I'm working in a team? So here you have a portrait of a leader who's perfect for someone like you. But we're not always, I mean, we're all flawed. We live in a flawed world. But what we're going to do now, we're going to go out into a breakout room. And you're going to, in groups of five, you're going to share what those qualities are to see with a group of four or five leaders, what do they create as a group portrait of effective leadership? So first of all, something, I, I just got the opportunity to sit in on a, a room like a big brother, but do you know what was lovely? People telling the truth, you know, and I, so for everybody who tells the truth, I always think that you're the permission givers. You know, when we we are flawed and, and we get into a world which tells edited stories of our, you know, we go away and we talk about this was wonderful and this was marvelous. And it was a wet Wednesday. It was a wet Thursday lunch hour and everything wasn't wonderful. 
And that when we're really trying to get to the heart of things and we talk honestly about the, the flaws that we've got and the things that we try to do, that's actually where we help. And that's where something like this can really work, this opportunity just to be in we groups and, and talking and you knowing that you're in the company of other people who live in real world. So for those people who 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 um, give permission in these groups, thank you. So I want to have a look at something which is probably the opposite of what you've just been talking about. And that is the model of leadership that we grew up with. It's the one that is disseminated. It's the one that our politicians are groomed into, that our celebrities, our sports people, and that we even groom ourselves professionally into. And it's the idea that when you hold, uh, we even have labels for it, principal, you know, principal leader, deputy principal, meaning that somehow we adopt a heroic mode and we become, to put it this way, singular, visionary, problem solver, fearless, all-knowing. We assign tasks and we get what we need by commanding, controlling or coercing. And that model is so unquestioned that institutionally it's the one that gets reinforced. And yet what I'd suggest is that our world is much more nuanced than that. And when we're really getting, especially when we're working with communities, with people who are under stress or in difficult situations, that model, which seems so good, is on one hand impossible to maintain without turning ourselves into a myth. And two, it doesn't draw on the wealth that's sitting around us. So if we have a look at the heroic model, I mean, here's a, here's a we certainly see it in, in politics played out where we have something like this. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, don't like this guy and I don't like what he said, but this idea that what we do is we go in there and we purposefully make people follow effectively. And we may um, put a veneer over the top and go, my team or the um, my kids, but it's still talking about the singular, my, my, you know, my school. And you, and you and it's so it runs so deeply into us it's, it's it gets into our language until we really start thinking through and going are these my kids or are these people who I am trying to grow to be you know so I have the responsibility as the grower but they're not actually my kids or my staff so. That heroic model is reinforced structurally. So if you ever look at our schools, traditionally, that's what they look like. There's the principal leader who some of you may be, you know, these, these people up in these upper echelons, you're supposed to, um, in the traditional model, if it's unquestioned, ultimate responsibility, ultimate power, ultimate um, decision-making, uh, consulting rather than co-creating, and high expectation. And the myth is that the further down in there, the less agency the person has. And, you know, when we left Teachers College, we probably were all told, look, just, just behave yourself a little bit until you climb up the ladder and then you can start bringing about change. And most of us probably went, bugger it. I'm still going to do it, but I'm just going to shut the door on my classroom and do it, you know, and hope it doesn't leak until it's successful. So we, this, this model, which says, wait, basically, it's a pause pedal. It goes, wait until the next step, wait until the next step, wait until the next step. But actually, if we are working with a community of people and they are all waiting in a tacitly prescribed world, we don't have people coming forward. And we can end up filling this gap with a false picture of who we are and a kind of false leadership. And that's why in some institutions, you know, you've probably been in these. And in fact, I would suggest that those first three things you wrote down came from what we might call a wounded hierarchy. So that is working inside an organization where sometimes a principal or a leader has got there based on ambition, not talent. And they are 
and and they will be afraid of talent underneath them so sometimes they won't employ highly talented people they won't employ people who question or challenge even though they may be brilliantly productive and brilliantly um uh generous and when we operate in a wounded hierarchy we're not only dealing with our own injuries but the injuries of the people around us and and they become generally the sign of a wounded hierarchy is it becomes inert it can be managed but it very rarely innovates and it tends to distribute blame going i can never get these staff the staff just won't take the initiative whereas when you're asked to come into one of those situations normally you're looking at why don't these people take initiative so if if we that's got that that idea of the single leader is often shaped by this idea and this is you see this in a lot of uh, us um books on leadership and it's the protege model it's very benevolent it goes here am i up here and i like you and recognize talent in you so i'm going to show you how to be get up to a place like this i'll 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 groom i'll uh, open doors for you i'll show you how to be just like me so you understand the system and you can do this cool thing so it's driven by a benevolent state but the interesting thing is and i mean okay i'm biased i kind of got a love affair with this country but if you actually look at some of the discourses around leadership in new zealand and australia they come closer to another model that we call the developmental leadership the person with the light is not the leader in that picture the person with the light is not the leader if you're this kind of leader you're the kind of person who's, who probably goes look it's my job to have your back i'm just behind your shoulder i know the system enough to deal with that other stuff so that you can do and go to where you need to sometimes sometimes we use it to describe certain kinds of coaches who know that everyone on their team is better at sports than they are they're better at the thing and the coach doesn't stand in front of everybody and go be like me but but she or he knows that the talent is finding its way and as the invisible leader or the developmental leader we we show our responsibility by not standing in front of them but by standing attentively behind and looking at the environment around them so it's a it's quite a different if you have a look at the two different models how to be like someone like me how to be someone like you with somebody who's really informed standing just at your shoulder and this is where occasionally you see it um somebody you can spot them um someone who says at the beginning of the year to somebody what do you need to help you do the best job possible this year tell me what i can do that will enable you to do an even better job than you are at the moment so this is where we talk about people who are very good listeners but they're actually really good questioners and they they they're decentered but they are not absolving themselves of the responsibility of caring in fact i would argue it's a greater responsibility and if you like this sometimes you go it'd be a lot easier just to be an authoritarian you know protege character but then if we have a look at some of our finest coaches this is definitely the model and it's definitely became obvious when we were looking at um uh leaders in organizations that became very dexterous and flexible and were able to navigate difficult stuff without a road map so here's the interesting thing maybe the school maybe this community we work with is not a hierarchy maybe our school looks more like this it's a series of complex relationships rem remembered grievances cooperations it's a very complex map it's not a simple hierarchy 
we are asked to lead messy, messy worlds. And that's a huge thing to ask of you. You know, what you do is very, very difficult. And it, it brings me to a question which was touched on in the first thing. If you imagine your st your the, st the group of people with whom you're working, if you like the staff in your school, or who who you have been given a positional thing as to show some kind of leadership, and if you have not got a heroic mode, it's something more decentralized. If you imagine that's a map of the people in your school, we can cross out all the lines that are connecting them. Who? Who has leadership in your school that's not you? Don't just look to the person who's in the position next to you, the deputy or the head of department. Here's a deep question, and it's not, don't discuss it with anyone else. Look across the map of all the people you know in your school. They don't have to even be teaching staff. Who, who influences And I, because you're not going to show anybody, I want you to write those names down in front of you so you can fix who these people are, because I'm going to ask you to do something with it. You're not going to share it. You're quite safe. Write down the names of two or three people in your school who have influence, but may sit somewhere quite different on that matrix. Don't be afraid to think laterally. It doesn't have to be teachers. It doesn't have to be adults. If you've got the names, think about those people and how and where you have seen leadership happening. So you might have two or three names down. You might have more than that. It says something pretty cool about you if you're able to stand back and look at the broad idea of the community that you have a responsibility for to be able to identify across that spectrum. So let's just look at an earlier name for invisible leadership, although I don't think it's quite, it doesn't mean quite the same, but in business, we talked about a thing called post-heroic leadership. So the heroic leadership is the one I was talking about, about you know, the Superman, Superman, Superwoman, super, super principle. But in Joiner, this is interesting because if you're not, you're actually quite rare. So Joiner, way back in 2007, noticed that in his research, and he was looking at a wide spectrum of companies, but in amongst there, there were some education providers, some schools, and found that actually 90% of the managers actually operated in or defaulted quickly to a heroic leadership mindset. That is, they assumed sole responsibility for setting the organization's objectives, coordinating subordinates, and managing their performance. And because we have been groomed into a hierarchy, if they weren't doing one of those, they delegated it to the next person on the hierarchy that they'd been trained to conceptually understand their community inside. But, you know, this idea of the post-heroic leader is really ancient, because if I go back to someone like Lao Tzu, said this, you know, that's also a great uh, description of really brilliant teachers, eh? When the kid is not a disciple of a teacher, they go, I learned how to read. I learned how to do this. And the teacher is so good as a leader that they are invisible in it. You know, in um, it's funny, in, in, my, in, my, in my other field where I work as a designer, we have this thing called a crystal goblet. And it's used to describe typography, writing. And it goes, when you've got a really, really skilled typographer, you cannot see all the, all the skills that have meant that that page is easy to read. It's like a crystal goblet. Their talent is so good, it's invisible. Their talent is so good, it's invisible. You know, and then you see the post-heroic coach and the team believes and knows it did well because they were a team, not because they were led by a hero. 
And this the dumbed down idea of the singular leader, we get the media comes in and go, oh, fire that coach. They're no good. Because this idea that that's the, the coach, the singular heroic model. And if you dump that heroic model and bring in another heroic model, it works. And yet we know when we're working in a staff, when we're working in a community, you can change as many heads as you like. But if the if the community's unwell, if they're injured or afraid, that's not what fixes it. That's not what fixes it. And some of you will have done amazing repair jobs in your life, giving people back, making their agency visible again, or making sure it can grow. It's a huge gift. It's a huge gift as a leader. And the problem is it's invisible. And so unless we sit down and actually talk about it, it passes under the radar. And so I'd like to flip into another. This is just a little thing to, for you to do before we go into a breakout room. Look at those names on your piece of paper. And see if you can and answer this for yourself. What are the leadership skills that those people have that I don't? In other words, what do they gift to the dynamics of leadership in my school? What are the leadership skills? That, and so just write them down next to those people. And it's five minutes because it'd be really great to really think about this one. So what we're going to ask you to do now, given that you have five, you have three people in front of you. And when you go into any discussion, you know, you don't carry their names, but you can carry the example. There's this person, you know. Um, here are these people who help make up the nature of leadership in your school that you recognize when you took a moment out to go, these people help make up the collective nature of leadership in our school. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into a, um, rather than share who they are, you're going to do something else, which is a quite a, it's a deep question of something that you could do that would have a huge impact. Um, what I'd like you to do is think about what you will do for those, what you could do for people like that that would make it easier for them to operate. Okay, so, we're, so the question is, look at those three people who you have described. Next week, what is something that you could do? It might not be the same thing for each person. What is something that you could do that would help them grow that kind of leadership that is so useful to your community? So here's the interesting thing. And here's the thing that possibly even true of you. One of the things that's most likely, and when the research tends to show, is these people don't even realize they're invisible leaders. Mm. They don't use the term. And when you see people using words like acknowledge or talk with them, sometimes they have no idea that they that when you were sitting on a Thursday afternoon in a room and you thought about all the people in that community with whom you work, they stepped forward and they would never have stepped forward themselves. And that recognition of leadership for an invisible leader, where they're not in front of a whole crowd and having to get embarrassed or anything, is a hugely, hugely affirming thing. Here we go to this one. This is just for you. So some of the session has been just for you. Having been in that discussion with those people and thought about this, I'd like you to email yourself now and promise not to open it until tomorrow. Promise not to. With the thing that you will undertake to do by this time next week, for at least one of those people, name it specifically what you'll do. No one else is going to see it. An email to yourself, a message for your back pocket that you won't open until tomorrow and you promise to do within the next week for one of those people. I'd just like to finish with this. People don't often realize how lonely leadership really is because in, this, in truth, if we're really, really doing it beyond the template, we are on 
a bit of a lonely road and sometimes without a road map. And sometimes we have to make very hard decisions when nobody else wants to make them. You know, and and sometimes we can't even talk about those with our staff because we're trying to keep a fair world. And the fact that you came on a Thursday afternoon and you've become part of some organization that goes, maybe we just need to connect in a realm where we can talk honestly with each other. And we might be able to share some stuff that makes this empty road not visibly populated, but populated with ideas that we share and that we've inherited from other people. Thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for all the times that nobody sees the influence you have. 